If you could open with me to uh, Luke 15. If you could open to Luke 15. And we're not going to spend the whole uh, time that we have together in this passage, but I just, I'd just i like to share something with you. Just, um, just briefly. So Luke 15... And this is, I'm just going to read a part of the prodigal son in Luke 15. You can start in verse 18. This is, this is where the prodigal, he, he realizes and knows just the sinful, dark place he's been in. And it says this in verse 18. I will arise and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight and am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring out the best robe and put it on him. And put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fatted calf here and kill it. And let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to be merry. We'll pray. Father, thank you so much for this time that we have together, and uh, how desperately we all need you, Lord. The time that we have here each Sunday and and other services that we attend, Lord, how desperate we need this time. It's an invaluable time, Lord. It's an eternal time. It's your time, and we want it to be your time this morning as as we come here and we meet, that we would just meet with you. We would receive from you. Lord, maybe we come in with a hard heart this morning. We pray that you would soften our hearts, Lord, that we would see our need for you and humble ourselves before you to receive from you. God, we pray that we would just place ourselves in your hands, Lord. We would not live apart from you. We would not live in pride and sin, but we would humble ourselves before you this morning as we come and receive from your word. And uh, we pray for your hand upon our time. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You can be seated. Um, I just want to share briefly, because a lot of the message that I have to share is not a gospel-centered message, I just want to share this with you beforehand, that this, this is who our God is. This is who the God of the Bible is, right? Jesus, just prior to this, in the story, he talks about um, the lost sheep, right? He talks about then, after that the lost coins, right? And how the shepherd and the woman with the coins, they rejoice, right? They rejoice over those things. And then he brings it to the prodigal son, right? And it's like an explosion, right? Someone loses a coin, that's one thing. But to me, I read it and it's just, it's kind of like the Lord wanted to do this contrast of someone losing a coin and they rejoice over it. But how, how much more does God rejoice over a lost son or daughter, right, who comes to him? And so because the, the, the rest of my message after this isn't going to be gospel-focused, I just want to share with you that this is who God is, right? Jesus, his first message, right, was what? What was the first thing he started saying when his ministry began? He said, repent, right? He said, to turn from sinful ways, right? To turn your life from sinful ways and submit your life to him, right? To know him as the Lord, to believe in his death, right? And believe in his resurrection, believe that he is Lord and he needs to be the Lord of your life and my life, right? 
That was the message. And I just think this parable or this story here of the lost son, it just shows how God receives us, right? So often we're, we're hesitant to repent. We're hesitant to turn to God. And we have wrong ideas about him and how he'll receive us. But here in the, in the prodigal son, this is exactly how God will receive you at any time, right? It says that what did he do? Once the son realized he was in the pig pen of sin, right? He had spent all the money that his father had given him and he had used it in, they call it prodigal living, which is essentially women and alcohol and just being um, really like the pigs that he was with. And he said, I'm no longer worthy, right? I've sinned against heaven and earth. And he arose and came to his father. But he, when he was a still, great, uh, still a great way off, his father saw him, had compassion, and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. Right? This is how the father, if you are in sin today, or you're in sin this week, you're far from God this week in your behavior, even if you're already his, like this is how he receives you. When we repent, right, and when we're returning to the Lord, he receives us the same way, coming and hugging and kissing us, right, and receiving us. And for those of you who don't know the Lord, it's the same, right? He comes, and when you, when you come to him and turn to him, this is how he receives you. This is who God is, right? This is the, the forgiveness that he offers you. And I think one thing with the story that's so amazing is that he doesn't start to talk with the son about all the wrong things that he had done, right? He doesn't start to talk to the son about all his failures, the wasted money, the sinful things he had entered in, right? That's not the focus of it. He receives him, you know? And so if you don't know the Lord today, there will be a time at the end that Dan's gonna lead us in where, where you, uh, can, you can have that opportunity to know and receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Um, so I wanted to start with that. And then in verse, this is verse um, 31. And for those of you who know, for those of you who know the story, there's also another son in the story, right? He's the older son. He wasn't prodigal. He didn't go live crazily, right? And there's more than focusing on him. I just want to focus on what what God says to him. This is Luke 15, 31. So this is the father in the story. He says, and he said to him, son, you are always with me and all that I have is yours. And I want to look at a couple of Old Testament passages today and kind of use this verse to think about them. Because we can read throughout the Old Testament different uh, people who are saints, believers in the Lord, followers of the Lord, people of faith, right? And they, they experience God, right? He, he was their God and they were his. And they had this experience, that that which was God's became theirs, right? And we, we can look at the Old Testament and we can see those stories and we're not gonna live the exact same thing, right? We're not gonna live through the same thing that Moses or Joseph lived, right? But the same way that they experience God, we also can experience him in our lives today. So I, I've been telling people that the Bible is such a big book. Do you agree with me or not? It's a big book, right? It's a large book. It's made up ultimately of 66 books, right, in it. And it's a large book. And why, why is that, right? It's not because God is like an English teacher who's like, oh, man, let's give him five more books to read, right? He's not 
like a literature teacher who just loves to read, and so therefore, I'd like you to just do a lot of reading too, right? That's not who God is. They, the Bible is full of stories that bring God glory, and then also, it's, I believe it's so big because God has so much to say about himself, right? He has so much to reveal to you and I about himself, right? It's not there just for homework. It's there because he has something to say to you and say to me. And the Bible, it's, it can be daunting, right? Because it's so big. I don't know how many. Each Bible has a different amount of pages, right? A thousand something pages or whatever, just depending on uh, which version or which uh, publisher or whatever. They're, it's just long, right? But for some of you, I'm sure the Bible can be daunting, right? It can be a lot to approach, to think about reading and learning. And, you know, I personally, I'm, I'm, a slow, I'm a slow learner myself. And one of my favorite Bible teachers, he's a, he's a West Coast pastor. He's in California. And, you know, I listened to his messages, and I remember one time he said that um, for him, the Bible was kind of a hard book. Like, it took him a long time. You know, he listened to a lot of messages, received a lot of things. But the, book, the Bible was not easy for him you know, it took time to understand it and get through it and learn it, you know. And that was comforting for me because this pastor, what's so interesting about him is he said that, that it was difficult for him at times. But this, this pastor's teachings are just so profound in that with the Bible, he's often getting to what is God's intent for a story, right? God, obviously, when, when something happens in the Bible, he glorifies himself with what happens, right? He... He had a purpose for what happened in that part of history and that story. But also, what is, what is the value uh, for you and I today? And I, and I find that um, this pastor's teaching really brings out the purpose of why different things are written for us today. And, that, and that's also what God wants for us, right? He wants you and I to experience in our reading of the Bible, in our studying of the Bible, what is his purpose uh, for us today? You, know, may, you may know um, some verses that are in Timothy. This is 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 through 17. And it just says that, that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. And so, you know, there's a lot that could be explained about these verses, but I just think about how simply stated, the Bible has an immense value for the life that God wants you to live, right? The Bible has an eternal value for the life that God wants you to live. So God, over time, wants us to learn his word and to know him in his word. But it's, it's really so much more than just retaining details and, and facts about things in history, right? It, it really is about encountering God in his word and his word being like a well of life for you and I. In John 7, it says this, John 7, uh, 37 through 38. On the last, on that last great day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out saying, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. In these verses, Jesus is speaking of the life of the Holy Spirit. But we know also that the life of the Holy Spirit works together with the word of God, right? They work together, right? You're not, 
going to be able to ultimately be a spiritual person for long if you have no knowledge of the Word of God, right? It takes also a relationship with the Word of God. And this is what Jesus, he, this is one of the very few times that Jesus cried out, right? He didn't cry out many times. John the Baptist was always crying out, but Jesus, not so much, right? But it says that he cried out, calling people to come and drink from him that they might have this, right? This river of living water. And, you know, I, I've been teaching, I've been teaching and reading the Bible for a long time. But I just, here in, you know, uh, when I was down in Argentina, the last thing I was teaching through is the book of Exodus, the Old Testament book. And I just did the, the first 10 chapters of the book. And I really couldn't believe it. I really enjoyed teaching through Genesis as well. But teaching through Exodus, I thought, like every chapter, every chapter of the book is like its own book. You know, it's just so, so full. There's so much in it. And for me, it really was like a well of water, God's living water bursting forth in my life, in my understanding and giving me things of value for my life and how I view God. And so I, I just want to go through a couple familiar stories just to think about ways that we can see God. You know, again, I don't know how you feel about Old Testament reading and just the, the study of the Bible, how challenging or not it is for you. But again, the, the encouragement or the exhortation I want to give you is that God has a well of life for you in whatever part of the Bible that you are, that you are in and you're reading. So I want to go over the story of Joseph. And we're just going to read a few verses of his, um, from his life. But I'll give you an overview of him real quick, right? He... How many of you are familiar with Joseph? Almost everyone, maybe. Okay, Joseph, the story of Joseph, right? Maybe you've seen a movie if you haven't read it in the Word. But Joseph was the favored son of Jacob, right? His dad favored him. And in that position, um, you know, he had 10 brothers who were older than him. And they, they actually conspired to kill him, right? And as you know, probably, he wasn't, he didn't end up being murdered, right? He was not murdered. But instead, his brothers sold him into slavery. And, and the traders that, that bought him sold him to an Egyptian, where at first he, he prospered. You know, he was a servant in the household, and he prospered and did well. But then he was accused, he was accused of rape, Right? Then from there, he's in jail, and he spent something like 9 to 12 years in jail. We don't know exactly how long, until Pharaoh calls him from prison to interpret his dreams. And God gives Joseph an interpretation for Pharaoh, and then Pharaoh immediately recognizes that Joseph is the person that he should use to be a leader to manage um, you know, the resources of Egypt to save them from this famine that's to come. And one other thing that happens in the story of Joseph is that shortly after Joseph comes to power, Pharaoh gives him a wife. And there's a couple interesting verses. These are in Genesis. We're going to put them up on the, um, the screen for you. But these are some interesting verses about the life of Joseph. And this is, if you know the story of Joseph, right? This is prior to Joseph being reconciled with his brothers. It's prior to him being reconciled with his brothers, and he doesn't know if his father's still alive. But this is Genesis uh, 41, verses 50 through 52. And it says, to, And to Joseph were born two sons before the years of the famine came, whom Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, priest of On, bore to him. Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh, for God has made me forget all my toil and all my father's house. And the name of the second he called Ephraim, for God has caused me to be fruitful 
in the land of my affliction. So with the birth of his two sons, right, Joseph says, God has made me forget and God has made me to be fruitful. And when you think about the life of Joseph, right, he spent something like 17 years really in in a, a long period of suffering, right? He lost the relationship with his father, his younger brother, he was taken from his family. He was enslaved. He ends up in prison for something like almost 10 years, right? All that, he suffered so much, you know, and we don't, we don't see it in the Bible. We see mostly just his steadiness and continuing to follow and serve God in whatever circumstance he ended up in. But how many sleepless nights did he have? You know, how many, how many nights of just weeping before the Lord with heartache over his circumstance, Right? And, you know, again, these verses that we read, they show us that God was able to comfort him, right? Despite, Despite his circumstances and what he had suffered, right? There's a comfort. There's something that happened within his heart where God ministered to him. And he says, of you know, in naming his son, he's making a statement, for God has made me forget right? And to me, I look at it and I just think, God, this is, who, this is who you were to Joseph. You healed his heart, right? He had suffered immense, immense pain and loss in his life. And you did something where he, he was able to forget, right? He was, he was able to not have to live any longer under the suffering that he endured, right? And to me, it's just an, an amazing thing because God, he, he doesn't put it like these things that are here, the life of Joseph, you're not going to live it, right? You're not going to, Pharaoh's not going to call you. There is no Pharaoh to call you. I, I don't know about dreams and your dreams and whatnot. Like we're not going to be used in the same way. We're not going to live through the same thing as Joseph. But to us, we can read the Bible and receive and see that God, just like God was to Joseph, relieving his heart from the things that he had suffered, the pain he had endured, he can be that same, same God to us, right? God has an intention that you would know him in his word, not just to have information about what it is that's happened, right? But also to see that he, he can be your God in the same way. And so God, God knew how to uniquely comfort and alleviate Joseph, even when the issues of his family and his father's house remained unsol- un, um, unresolved, sorry, and, you know, if you read on in the story, you'll see just the amazing work that God does between him and his brothers. But here, you know, we see the character of God, right? He, and we read also in the New Testament, he's the God of all comfort, right? It says, so this is the, the character of God, just a simple part of the story that you, can, that you can see with the life of Joseph of how he can comfort a man and how he can comfort us, the same God. If the same God who is Joseph's God, is your God. He can comfort you. I want to do a, another one, just another one briefly. This is Moses and his parents. Um, this is in Exodus. Maybe you could turn there. or We'll put up the, I think we'll put up the verses as well. But Exodus chapter 2. And this story is about Moses. Probably many of you are familiar with Moses as well, who, who ended up being God's chosen uh, man, to lead the children of Israel out of slavery and out of Egypt, right? But this, his story of faith really starts with his parents. And again, the point that I want to make is that we can look at the story. We're not going to live the same things that Moses lived, but his story has a value for our lives where we can receive and know the same God that he and his parents knew. And so it says in verses one through three of chapter two, and and the man of the house of Levi went and took as wife a daughter of Levi. So the woman conceived and bore a son. And when she saw that that he was a beautiful child, she hid him three months. 
But when she could no longer hide him, she took an ark of bulrushes, bulrushes for him, daubed it with asphalt and pitch, put the child in it, and laid it in the reeds by the river's bank. And I want to read a verse. This is from, from Hebrews 11. And it um, kind of amplifies what's happening here, right? Because this woman, uh, she went, she, by protecting her son and saving her son, it was an act of faith. In Hebrews 11, it says this, in verse 23, by faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child and they were not afraid of the king's command. So, again, the point being, we, we read through the Old Testament, God gets glory for the stories, what it is that happened as people lived a life of faith. There's just glory, right? We see God's glory over all the pages of the Bible. But also within it, we can see something that serves our life, right? Thousands of years later, there's a story that serves our life and who God is and that the God of Moses' parents can also be our God. And I don't know if you, how familiar you are with the story of Moses and what was happening, right? The, the Israelites were enslaved in Egypt. They be, well, first they began to multiply because of Joseph and what happened with the famine. They ended up in Egypt, right? But then over time, they began to multiply. And so the people of Egypt were worried about that. Pharaoh was worried about that. And they started to actually enslave the people of Israel, right? Then after they enslaved the people of Israel, they still kept multiplying. So then Pharaoh's like, okay, we need to make their burdens worse. We need to make things harder for them. And that didn't stop them from multiplying. They kept multiplying even more after that. So then Pharaoh actually tried to coerce um, some Hebrew midwives to take the babies at their birth and kill them, right? So this is Pharaoh's second, third plan to try and stop the Hebrews in, 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 the, um, in the population growth. He tries to get the, uh, the, the midwives to kill the Hebrew baby boys at the time of birth. And we see in the Bible that the midwives didn't cooperate. So then Pharaoh gives a command to his people to do what? To throw the babies into the river, Right? So this is like, it's really intense because think about laws, right? There's laws for the speed limit, laws for different things, you know, laws of things that we can't do and cannot do. You have to understand when Pharaoh says, I command you to throw the Hebrew baby boys into the river, it's, the, it's like literally the law of the land and all the Egyptians are now supposed to obey that law. So it's really, really intense when you think about it. And so the Israelites lived in this condition, right? And this woman, right, this mother of Moses, she lives under this unbelievably immense pressure. But what happens? It says that they saw he was a, Moses was a beautiful child, which, prob which probably indicates they also they had like a sense that God had a, a unique purpose for his life. And then they, they hid him, right? So she hid her pregnancy. She hid Moses even after he was born, right? And one of the, one of the interesting things that it says in, in Hebrews is what? Verse 23, they were not afraid of the king's command. Now, what would have happened, right, if the Egyptians found out what she was doing? They would not have come only and taken Moses and thrown him in the river, right? They would have come for her, her husband, and um, she had two other children, Aaron and Miriam, at that time, right? The, the whole family was in danger. But this woman, right, she lived fearlessly, essentially, right? And so, 
This whole story, right, it's, the, it's just an, ex, it's an extreme story, right? Obviously, it's very, very extreme what's happening in it. But this woman had a fearless faith to follow the Lord even in the midst of intense, intense pressure. And this, you know, again, just like this is their God that we're reading about, this is our God, right? He can give us a fearlessness to live for him in the midst of immense pressure, you know? If you're raising children in, in the, the world that we live in today, in, in this country, you know, you can have fears, you can have doubts, you can have concerns, all these things you're trying to protect your kids from, right? I'm, I'm 40, I'm almost 43, actually. But when I was in high school, I was 18, right, whatever, 17, I think I was 17 maybe at the time, and I had a good friend, and one day in class, he's just like, I'm never gonna have kids in this crazy world, you know? And that was, that was whatever, it's a long time ago, whatever, 25 years ago, something like that. You know, 25 years ago, I'm in high school with this kid saying this, that like he wouldn't want to have children because of the suffering they could potentially encounter in this world. And you know, you may, be, you may feel the same way, that it's difficult just to, to have kids in a world like we live in today, right? And, and just the circumstances of different things or things that are pushed um, that you may be fearful of. But we, when you read a story like this, it's meant for you to be in awe of God and what he did, but also for you to say, I could, I could live with the faith that Moses' parents lived. I can have the same faith. I can believe that God will protect me and my family and be with me despite whatever circumstances, right? That's what God, God doesn't give us a story so we say, that was great, it should become a movie and live somewhere af- apart from us, right? It's something that should live in your heart that I could live with the same fearlessness as, um, as Moses' parents. And for me, you know, reading the Bible in this way, again, it's like that, that verse, those verses in John 7, uh, 37 through 38, which just say that his, his, his word and his spirit, they're like a well of water bubbling up, right, and filling and fl- overflowing um, within and, and through us. And so... Um, I had one more, but we don't actually have time for it. <laughs> so anyway, I won't, I won't get into another one. But, you know, the, the Bible is so rich. And when we come to uh, the Lord with a humble heart, you know, repentant heart, and we come to just receive from him, he, he has so much, so much to give to us, right? Just like he said to, to the older son and the father in the story of the prodigal, Right? All that I have is yours, right? God is not holding back from you today, right? It's always on our end to repent and turn to him. But when we go to him in his word, like the Lord, he wants you to receive from, he wants you to know him and see that the God of this person of faith or the God of this other person of faith that's in this story, like he offers himself to you today in 2023, even though it's, you know, years removed and culture is different. Like his word speaks to each of us today when we have the ears to hear it. So uh, thank you for your time. And Dan, Dan's going to come up to close out uh, the time we have. All right, thank you, Greg. Worship team, you guys can come up. And prayer couples, if you would come up as well. You know, there's a number of things in that message here that you may want to come up and and pray about. Um, So Greg and Jillian will be up here and others will as well. Maybe you are here this morning and you are like that younger son who has been a prodigal and is not, who needs to come back, needs to come repent. And if that is you, I just want to encourage you to come up and pray with someone. Or the second one, where most of the message was here today, you know, um, (laughs) most of his parents live lives of faith, and faith requires action and requires a lot of courage. It can be really challenging. Maybe there's something in your life that you just need prayer about. And so I just want to encourage you as we sing this last song um, to come up and and pray. So you can all stand. We're actually going to sing um, kind of in relation to what we just heard here this morning, the psalm. The song is just called Same God, which is really just connecting 
everything of the God of the Old Testament to who we are here today. So why don't we pray and we will we'll sing, and if you want prayer, come forward. Father, I just thank you so much just that you are the same God today that you were then. And as you came alongside Moses' parents and just gave them the, the, the faith to be able to do that and, and just, to, just to step into a place of great uncertainty, that you are not changed or different now. Your word says that you are the same. So, Lord, as we just continue today, I just pray, Lord, for anyone that might just want to come up here and just receive prayer about any of this. And we pray all this in your name. Amen. Mm-hmm.